Chapter 15. How Danny brooded and became mad. How the devil in the shape of Torelli assaulted Danny's house. There was a changeless quality about Monterey. Nearly every day in the morning the sun shines in the windows on the west sides of the street and in the afternoon on the east side of the street. Every day, the red bus clangs back and forth between Monterey and Pacific Grove. Every day, the canneries send a stink of reducing fish into the air. Every afternoon, the wind blows in from the bay and sways the pines on the hills. The rock fishermen sit on the rocks holding their poles, and their faces are graven with patience and with cynicism. On Tortilla Flat above Monterey, the routine is changeless, too for there is only a given number of adventures that Cornelia Ruiz can have with her slowly changing procession of sweethearts. She has been known to take again a man long since discarded. In Danny's house, there was even less change. The friends had sunk into a routine which might have been monotonous for anyone but a paisano. Up in the morning, to sit in the sun and wonder what the pirate would bring. The pirate still cut pitchwood and sold it in the streets of Monterey, but now he brought food with the quarter he earned every day. Occasionally, the friends procured some wine, and then there was singing and fighting. Time is more complex near the sea than in any other place, for in addition to the circling of the sun and the turning of the seasons, the waves beat out the passage of time on the rocks and the tides rise and fall as a great clepsydra. Danny began to feel the beating of time. He looked at his friends and saw how with them every day was the same. When he got out of his bed in the night and stepped over the sleeping paisanos, he was angry with them for being there. Gradually sitting on the front porch in the sun, Danny began to dream of the days of his freedom. He had slept in the woods in summer and in the warm hay of barns when the winter cold was in. The weight of property was not upon him. He remembered that the name of Danny was a name of storm. Oh, the fights! The fights through the woods with an outraged chicken under his arm. The hiding places in the gulch when an outraged husband proclaimed feud. Storm and violence. Sweet violence. When Danny thought of the old lost time, he could taste again how good the stolen food was. And he longed for that old time again. Since his head inheritance had lifted him, he had not fought often. He had been drunk, but not adventurously so. Always the weight of the house was upon him, always the responsibility to his friends. Danny began to mope on the front porch so that his friends thought him ill. Tea made from yerba buena would be good, Pilon suggested. If you will go to bed, Danny, we will put hot rocks to your feet. It was not coddling Danny wanted. It was freedom. For a month, he brooded, stared at the ground, looked with sullen eyes at his ubiquitous friends, kicked the friendly dogs out of his way. In the end, he gave up to his longing. One night, he ran away. He went into the pine woods and disappeared. When in the morning the friends awakened and found him missing, Pilon said, It is some lady. He is now in love. They left it there. For every man has a right to love. The friends went on living as they had. But when a week passed with no sign of Danny, they began to worry. In a body they went to the woods to look for him. Love is nice, said Pilon. We cannot blame any man for following a girl, but... A week is a week. It must be a lively girl to keep Danny away for a week. Pablo said, A little love is like a little wine. Too much of either will make a man sick. Maybe Danny is already sick. Maybe this girl is too lively. Jesus Maria was worried too. It is not like the Danny we know to be gone so long. Some bad thing has happened. The pirate took his dogs into the woods. The friends advised the dog, Find Danny, he may be sick. Somewhere he may be dead. That good Danny who lets you sleep in his house. The pirate whispered to them, Oh, evil, ungrateful dogs, find our friend. 
But the dogs waved their tails happily and sought out a rabbit and went kiyuling after it. The paisanos ranged all day through the woods, calling Danny's name, looking in places they themselves might have chosen to sleep in, the good hollows between the roots of the trees, the thick needle beds encircled by bushes. They knew where a man would sleep, but they found no sign of Danny. Perhaps he is mad, Pilon suggested. Some secret worry may have turned his wit. In the evening they went back to Danny's house and opened the door and went in. Instantly they became intense. A thief had been busy. Danny's blankets were gone. All the food was stolen. Two pots were missing. Pilon looked quickly at Big Joe Portigy, and then he shook his head. No, you were with us. You didn't do it. Danny did it, said Pablo excitedly. Truly he is mad. He is running through the woods like an animal. Great care and worry settled on Danny's house. We must find him, the friends assured one another. Some harm will fall upon our friend in his craziness. We must search through the whole world until we find him. They threw off their laziness. Every day they looked for him, and they began to hear curious rumors. Yes, Danny was here last night. Oh, that drunk one. Oh, that thief. Borsi, Danny knocked down the Viejo with a fence picket, and he stole a bottle of grappa. What kind of friends are these who let their friend do such things? Yes, we saw Danny. His eye was closed, and he was singing. Come into the woods, and we will dance, little girls. But we would not go. We were afraid that Danny did not look very quiet. At the wharf, they found more evidence of their friend. He was here, the fisherman said. He wanted to fight everybody. Benito broke an oar on Danny's head. Then Danny broke some windows, and then a policeman took him to jail. Out on the path of their wayward friend, they continued, McNair brought him in last night, the sergeant said. Some way he got loose before morning. When we catch him, we'll give him six months. The friends were tired of the chase. They went home, and to their horror they found that the new sack of potatoes that Belone had found only that morning was gone. Now it is too much, Pilone cried. Danny is crazy and he is in danger. Some terrible thing will happen to him if we do not save him. We will search, said Jesus Maria. We will look behind every tree and every shed, Pablo guaranteed. Under the boats and on the beach, Big Joe suggested. The dogs will help, the pirate said. Pilone shook his head. That is not the way every time we come to a place after Danny has gone. We must wait in some place where he will come. We must act as wise men, not as fools. But where will he come? The light struck all of them at once. Torelli's. Sooner or later, Danny will go to Torelli's. We must go there to catch him, to restrain him in the madness that has fallen upon him. Yes, they agreed. We must save Danny. In a body, they visited Torelli, and Torelli would not let them in. Ask me, he cried through the door, have I seen Danny? Danny brought three blankets and two cooking pots, and I gave him a gallon of wine. What did that devil do then? My wife he insulted, and me he called bad names. My baby he spanked, my dog he kicked. He stole the hammock from my porch, Torelli gasped with emotion. I chased him to get my hammock back, and when I returned, he was with my wife. Seducer, thief, drunkard. That is your friend, Danny. I myself will see that he goes to the penitentiary. The eyes of the friends glinted. Oh, Corsican pig, Pilon said evenly. You speak of our friend. Our friend is not well. Torelli locked the door. They could hear the bolt side, but Pilon continued to speak through the door. Oh, Jew, he said, if thou wert a little more charitable with thy wine, these things would not happen. See that thou keepest that cold frog, which is thy tongue, from dirtying our friend. See thou treatest him gently, for his friends are many. We will tear thy stomach out, if thou art not nice to him. Torelli made no sounds inside the locked house, but he trembled with rage and fear at the ferocity of the tones. He was relieved when he heard the footsteps of friends receding up the path. 
That night, after the friends had gone to bed, they heard a stealthy step in the kitchen. They knew it was Danny, but he escaped before they can catch him. They wandered about in the dark, calling disconsolately, Come, Danny, our little sugar friend, we need thee with us. There was no reply. But a thrown rock struck Big Joe in the stomach and doubled him up on the ground. Oh, how the friends were dismayed and how their hearts were heavy. Danny is running to his death, they said sadly. Our little friend is in need and we cannot help him. It was difficult to keep the house now, for Danny had stolen nearly everything in it. A chair turned up at a bootlegger's. All the food was taken, and once they were searching for Danny in the woods, he stole the airtight stove, but it was heavy and he abandoned it in the gulch. Money there was done, for Danny stole the pirate's wheelbarrow and traded it to Joe Ortiz for a bottle of whiskey. Now all peace had gone from Danny's house, and there was only worry and sadness. Where is our happiness gone, Pablo mourned? Somewhere we have sinned. It is a judgment. We should go to confession. No more did they discuss the marital parade of Cornelia Ruiz. Gone were the moralities. Lost were the humanities. Truly the good life lay in ruins. And into the desolation came the rumors. Danny committed partial rape last night. Danny has been milking Mrs. Palachico's goat. Danny was in a fight with some soldiers the night before last. Sad as they were at his moral decay, the friends were not a little jealous of the good time Danny was having. If he is not crazy, he will be punished, said Pilon. Be sure of that. Danny is sitting in a way which, sin for sin, beats any record I ever heard of. Oh, the penances when he wants to be decent again. In a few weeks, Danny has piled up more sins than old Ruiz did in a lifetime. That night, Danny, unhindered by the friendly dogs, crept into the house as silently as the moving shadow of a limb under a street light, and wantonly he stole Pilon's shoes. In the morning, it did not take Pilon long to understand what had happened. He went firmly to the porch and sat down in the sun and regarded his feet. Now he has gone too far, Pilon said. Pranks he has played, and we were patient. But now he turns to crime. This is not the Danny we know. This is another man, a bad man. We must capture this bad man. Pablo looked complacently down at his shoes. Maybe this is only a prank, too, he suggested. Nope, Pilon said severely. This is crime. They were not very good shoes but it is a crime against friendship to take them. And that is the worst kind of crime. If Danny will steal the shoes of his friends, there is no crime he will stop at. The friends nodded in agreement. Yes, we must catch him, said Jesus Maria of the Humanities. We know he is sick. We will tie him to his bed and try to cure him of the sickness. We must try to wipe the darkness from his brain. But now, said Pablo, before we catch him, we must remember to put our shoes under our pillows when we sleep. The house was in a state of siege. All about it raged Danny, and Danny was having a wonderful time. Seldom did the face of Torelli show any emotions but suspicion and anger. In his capacity as bootlegger and in his dealings with the people of Tortilla Flat, those two emotions were often called into his heart, and their line was written on his face. Moreover, Torelli had never visited anyone. He had only to stay at home and to have everyone visit him. Consequently, when Torelli walked up the road toward Danny's house in the morning, his face suffused with a ferocious smile of pleasure and anticipation. The children ran into their yards and peeked through the pickets at him. The dogs caressed their stomachs with their tails and fled with backward fearful looks. Men, meeting him, stepped out of his path and clenched their fists to repel a madman. This morning the fog covered the sky. The sun, after a number of unsuccessful skirmishes, gave up and retired behind the gray folds. The pine trees dripped dusty dew on the ground, and in the faces of the few people who were about, 
the day was reflected with somber looks and gray skins. There were no hearty greetings. There was none of that human idealism which blandly hopes this day will be better than all other days. Old Roca, seeing Danny smiling, went home and told his wife, that one has just killed and eaten his children. You will see. Trelly was happy, for in his pocket there was a folded precious paper. His fingers sought his coat again and again, and pressed until a little crackling sound assured Torelli that the paper was still there. As he walked through the gray morning, he muttered to himself, Nest of snakes, he said, I will wipe out this pestilence of Danny's friends. No more will I give wine for goods and have the goods stolen again. Each man alone is not so bad, but the nest of them. Madonna looked down how I will cast them onto the street. The toads, the lice, the stinging flies. When they sleep in the woods again, they will not be so proud. I would have known that Torelli has triumphed. They thought to cheat me, to spoil my house of furniture and my wife of virtue. They will see that Torelli, the great sufferer, can strike back. Oh, yes, they will see. Thus he muttered as he walked, and his fingers crackled the paper in his pocket. The trees dripped mournful drops into the dust. The seagulls circled in the air screaming tragically. Torelli moved like gray fate on Danny's house. In Danny's house there was a gloom. The friends could not sit on the porch in the sunshine, for there was no sunshine. No one can produce a better reason for gloom. They had brought back the stolen stove from the gulch and set it up. They clustered to it now, and Johnny Pom Pom, who had come to call, told the news he had. Tito Ralph, he said, is no longer the jailer down at City Hall. Now this morning, the police judge sent him away. I like Tito Ralph, said Pilone. When a man was in jail, Tito Ralph would bring him a little wine. And he knew more stories than a hundred other men. Why did he lose his job, Johnny Pom Pom? That's what I came to tell. Tito Ralph, you know, was often in jail. And he was a good prisoner. He knew how a jail should be run. After a while, he knew more about that jail than anyone. Then Daddy Marks, the old jailer, died, and Tito Ralph took his place. Never has there been such a good jailer as Tito Ralph. Everything he did just right. But he has one little fault. When he drinks wine, he forgets he is the jailer. He escapes, and they have to catch him. The friends nodded. I know, said Pablo. I have heard he is hard to catch, too. He hides. Yes, continued Johnny Papa except for that. He is the best jailer they ever had. Well, this is the thing that I came to tell. Last night, Danny had enough wine for ten men, and he drank it. Then he drew pictures on windows. He was very rich. He bought eggs to throw at a Chinaman. And one of those eggs missed the Chinaman and hit a policeman. So Danny was in jail. But he was rich. He sent Tito Ralph out to get some wine and then some more wine. There were four men in the jail. They all drank wine. And at last, that fault of Tito Ralph's came out. So he escaped, and all the others escaped with him. They caught Tito Ralph this morning and told him he could not be jailer anymore. He was so sad that he broke a window. And now he's in jail again. But Danny, Pilone cried. What about Danny? Oh, Danny, said Johnny Pompon. He escaped too. They did not catch him. The friends sighed in dismay. Danny is getting bad, Pilone said seriously. He will not come to a good end. I wonder where he got the money. It was at this moment that the triumphant Torelli opened the gate and strode up the path. The pirate's dogs got up nervously from the corner and moved toward the door, snarling. The friends looked up and questioned one another with their eyes. Big Joe picked up the pick handle that had so lately been used on him. The heavy, confident step of Torelli pounded on the porch. The door flew open, and there stood Torelli, smiling. He did not bluster at them. No, he approached as delicately as a house cat. He patted them kindly as a house cat pats a cockroach. Oh, my friends, he said gently at their looks of alarm. 
My dear good friends and customers, my heart is torn that I must be a carrier of bad news to those whom I love. Pilon leaped up. Is it Danny? He is sick. He is hurt. Tell us. Torelli shook his head daintily. No, my little ones, it is not Danny. My heart bleeds, but I must tell you that you cannot live here any more. His eyes gloated at the amazement his words wrought. Every mouth dropped open. Every eye went blank with astonishment. That is foolish, Pablo cried. Why can't we live here any more? Torelli's hand went lovingly into his breast pocket, and his fingers brought out the precious paper and waved it in the air. Imagine my suffering, Torelli went on. Danny does not own this house any more. What? they cried. What do you mean? How does not Danny own his house any more? Speak, O Corsican pig. Torelli giggled. A thing so terrible that the paisano stepped back from him. Because, he said, the house belongs to me. Danny came to me and sold me his house for $25 last night. Fiendishly, he watched the thoughts crowd on their faces. It is a lie, their faces said. Danny would not do such a thing. And then, but Danny has been doing many bad things lately. He has been stealing from us. Maybe he has sold the house over our heads. It is a lie, Pilon cried about. It is a dirty wop lie. Torelli smiled on and waved the paper. Here I have proof, he said. Here is the paper Danny signed. It is what we of business call a bill of sale. Pablo came to him furiously. You got him drunk. He did not know what he did. Torelli opened the paper a little bit. The law will not be interested in that, he said. And so, my dear little friends, it is my terrible duty to tell you that you must leave my house. I have plans for it. His face lost its smile then, and all the cruelty came back into it. If you are not out by noon, I will send a policeman. Pilon moved gently toward him. Oh, beware, Torelli, when Pilon moves smiling on you. Run, hide yourself in some iron room, and weld up the door. I do not understand these things, Pilon said gently. Of course, I am sad that Danny should do a thing like this. Torelli giggled again. I never had a house to sell, Pilon continued. Danny signed this paper, is that it? Yes, Torelli mimicked him. Danny signed this paper. That is it. Pilon blundered on stupidly. That is the thing that proves you own this house? Yes, O oh little fool, this is the paper that proves it. Pilon looked puzzled. I thought you must take it down and have some record made. Torelli laughed scornfully. Oh, beware, Torelli. Do you not see how quietly these snakes are moving? There is Jesus Maria in front of the door. There is Pablo by the kitchen door. See Big Joe's knuckles white on the pick handle? Torelli said, you know nothing of business, little hobos and tramps. When I leave here, I shall take this paper down, and... It happened so quickly that the last words belched out explosively. His feet flew up in the air. He landed with a great thump on the floor and clawed at the air with his fat hands. He heard the stove lid clang. Thieves, he screamed. The blood pressed up his neck and into his face. Thieves, oh rats and dogs, give me my paper. Pilon, standing in front of him, looked amazed. Paper? He asked politely. What is this paper you speak of so passionately? My bill of sale, my ownership. Oh, the police will hear of this. I do not recall a paper, said Pilon. Pablo, do you know what is this paper he talks about? Paper, said Pablo. Does he mean a newspaper or a cigarette paper? Pilon continued with the roll. Johnny Pom Pom? He is dreaming, maybe that one, said Johnny Pom Pom. Jesus Maria, do you know of a paper? I think he is drunk, Jesus Maria said in a scandalized voice. It is too early in the morning to be drunk. Joe Portigy? I wasn't here, Joe insisted. I just came in now. Pirate? He don't have no paper. Pirate turned to his dogs. Do he? 
Lone turned back to the apoplectic Torelli. You are mistaken, my friend. It is possible that I might have been wrong about this paper, but you can see for yourself that no one but you saw this paper. Do you blame me when I think that maybe there was no paper? Maybe you should go to bed and rest a little? Torelli was too stunned to shout anymore. They turned him about and helped him out of the door and sped him on his way, sunk in the awfulness of his defeat. And then they looked at the sky and were glad, for the sun had fought again, and this time won a pathway through the fog. The friends did not go back into the house. They sat happily down on the front porch. Twenty-five dollars, said Pilone. I wonder what he did with the money. The sun, once its first skirmish was won, drove the fog headlong from the sky. The porch boards warmed up. The flies sang in the light. Exhaustion had settled on the friends. It was a close thing, Pablo said warily. Danny should not do such things. We will get our wine from Torelli to make it up to him, said Jesus Maria. A bird hopped into the rose bush and flirted its tail. Mrs. Morales' new chicken sang a casual hymn to the sun. The dogs in the front yard thoughtfully scratched all over and gnawed their tails. At the sound of footsteps from the road, the friends looked up and then stood up with welcoming smiles. Danny and Tito Ralph walked in the gate, and each of them carried two heavy bags. Jesus Maria darted into the house and brought out the fruit jars. The friends noticed that Danny looked a little tired when he set his jugs on the porch. It is hot climbing that hill, Danny said. Tito Ralph, cried Johnny Pom Pom, I heard you were put in jail. I escaped again, Tito Ralph said wanly. I still had the keys. The fruit jars gurgled full. A great sigh escaped from the men, a sigh of relief that everything was over. Pilone took a big drink. Danny, he said, that pig Torelli came up here this morning with lies. He had a paper, he said, you signed. Danny looked startled. Where is that paper, he demanded. Well, Pilone continued, we knew it was a lie, so he burned that paper. You didn't sign it, did you? No, said Danny, and he drained his jar. It would be nice to have something to eat, observed Jesus Maria. Danny smiled sweetly. I forgot, in one of those bags are three chickens and some bread. So great was Pilone's pleasure and relief that he stood up and made a little speech. Where is there a friend like our friend, he exclaimed. He takes us into his house out of the cold. He shares his good food with us and his wine. Oh, he, the good man, the dear friend. Danny was embarrassed. He looked at the floor. It is nothing, he murmured. It has no merit. But Pilone's joy was so great that it encompassed the world and even the evil things of the world. We must do something nice sometime for Torelli, he said. Chapter 16 of the Sadness of Danny How through sacrifice Danny's friends gave a party How Danny was translated When Danny came back to his house and to his friends after his amok, he was not conscience-stricken, but he was very tired. The rough fingers of violent experience had harped upon his soul. He began to live listlessly, arising from bed only to sit on the porch under the Rose of Castile, arising from the porch only to eat, arising from the table only to go to bed. The talk flowed about him and he listened, but he did not care. Cornelia Ruiz had a quick and superb run of husbands and no emotion was aroused in Danny. When Big Joe got in his bed one evening, so apathetic was Danny that Pilone and Pablo had to beat Big Joe for him. When Sammy Rasper, celebrating a belated New Year with a shotgun and a gallon of whiskey, killed a cow and went to jail, Danny could not even be drawn into a discussion of the ethics of the case. Although the arguments raged about him, and although his judgment was passionately appealed to. 
After a while it came about that the friends began to worry about Danny. He has changed, said Pilone. He is old. Jesus Maria suggested, this Danny has crowded the good times of a life into a little three weeks. He is sick of fun. In vain the friends tried to draw him from the cavern of his apathy. In the mornings on the porch, they told their funniest stories. They reported details of the love life of Tortilla Flat so penetratingly that they would have been of interest to a dissection class. Pilon winnowed the flat for news and brought home every seedling of interest to Danny. But there was age in Danny's eyes and weariness. Thou art not well, Jesus Maria insisted in pain. There is some bitter secret in thine heart. No, said Danny. It was noted that he let flies crawl on his feet a long time, and that when he did slap them off, there was no art in his stroke. Gradually, the high spirits, the ready laughter, went out of Danny's house and tumbled into the dark pool of Danny's quietness. Oh, it was a pity to see him, that Danny who had fought for lost causes or any other kind, that Danny who could drink glass for glass with any man in the world. That Danny who responded to the look of love like an aroused tiger. Now he sat on his front porch in the sunlight, his blue-jeaned knees drawn up against his chest, his arms hanging over, his hands dangling from limp wrists, his head bent forward as though by a heavy black thought. His eyes had no light of desire, nor displeasure, nor joy, nor pain. Poor Danny, how has life left thee? Here thou sittest like the first man before the world grew up around him, and like the last man after the world has eroded away. But see, Danny, thou art not alone. Thy friends are caught in this state of thine. They look at thee from their eye corners. They wait like expectant little dogs for the first walking movement of their master. One joyful word from thee, Danny, one joyful look, and they will bark and chase their tails. Thy life is not thine to govern, Danny, for it controls other lives. See how thy friends suffer? Spring to life, Danny, that thy friends may live again. This in effect, although not in words so beautiful, was what Pilon said. Pilon held out a jar of wine to Danny. Come on, he said, get up off your can. Danny took the jar and drained it. And then he settled back and tried to find again his emotional nirvana. Do you hurt any place? Pilone asked. No, said Danny. Pilone poured him another jar of wine and watched his face while the wine disappeared. The eyes lost their lackluster. Somewhere in the depths, the old Danny stirred to life for a moment. He killed a fly with a stroke that would have done justice to a master. Slowly a smile spread over Pilone's face. And later he gathered all the friends Pablo, and Jesus Maria, and Big Joe, and the Pirate, and Johnny Pom Pom, and Tito Ralph. Pilon led them all into the gulch behind the house. I gave Danny the last of the wine, and it did him good. What Danny needs is lots of wine, and maybe a party. Where can we get wine? Their minds combed the possibilities of Monterey like rat terriers in a barn, but there were no rats. The friends were urged on by altruism more pure than most men can conceive. They loved Danny. Jesus Maria said finally, Chin Key is packing squids. Their minds bolted with curiosity and looked at the thing, crept stealthily back and sniffed it. It was several moments before their shocked imaginations could become used to the thing. But after all, why not? They argued silently. One day would not be so bad. Only one day. Their faces showed the progress of the bottle and how they were defeating their fears in the interest of Danny's welfare. We will do it, Pilone said. Tomorrow we will all go down and cut squid. And tomorrow night we will give a party for Danny. When Danny awakened the next morning, the house was deserted. He got up from his bed and looked through the silent rooms. But Danny was not a man to brood very long. He gave it up as a problem and then as a thought. He went to the front porch and listlessly sat down. 
Is it premonition, Danny? Do you fear the fate that is closing in on you? Are there no pleasures left? No. Danny is as sunk in himself as he had been for a week. Not so, Tortilla Flat. Early the rumor flew about. Danny's friends are cutting squids for Chin Key. It was important, like the overflow of government, or even of the solar system. It was spoken of in the street, called over back fences to ladies who were just then hurrying to tell it. All of Danny's friends are down cutting squids. The morning was electric with the news. There must be some reason, some secret. Mothers instructed their children and sent them running toward Chin Key's squid yard. Young matrons waited anxiously behind their curtains for later news. And news came. Pablo has cut his hand with a squid knife. Chin Key has kicked the pirate's dogs. Riot. The dogs are back. Pilon looks grim. A few small bets were laid. For months, nothing so exciting had happened. During one whole morning, not a single person spoke of Cornelia Ruiz. It was not until the noon hour that the real news leaked out, but then it came with a rush. They are going to have a big party for Danny. Everyone is going. Instructions began to emerge from the squid yard. Mrs. Morales dusted her phonograph and picked out her loudest records. Some sparks flared and Tortilla Flat was tinder. Seven friends, indeed, to give a party for Danny. It is as tough to say Danny had only seven friends. Mrs. Soto descended upon her chicken yard with a cleaver. Mrs. Palachico poured a bag of sugar into her largest cooking pot to make dolces. A delegation of girls went into the Woolworth store in Monterey and bought a complete stock of colored crepe paper. Guitars and accordions cried experimentally through the flat. News! More news from the squid yard. They are going to make it. They are firm. They will have at least $14. See that 14 gallons of wine are ready. Torelli was overwhelmed with business. Everyone wanted to buy a gallon to take to Danny's house. Torelli himself, caught in the fury of the movement, said to his wife, Maybe we will go to Danny's house. I will take a few gallons for my friends. As the afternoon passed, waves of excitement poured over the flat. Dresses, unworn in a lifetime, were unpacked and hung to air. Shawls the moths had yearned for during 200 years hung from the porch railings and exuded the odor of mothballs. And Danny, he sat like a half-melted man. He moved only when the sun moved. If he realized that every inhabitant of Tortilla Flat had passed his gate that afternoon, he gave no sign. Poor Danny. At least two dozen pairs of eyes watched his front gate. At about four o'clock he stood up, stretched and sauntered out of his yard toward Monterey. Why, they hardly waited until he was out of sight. Oh, the twisting and stringing of green and yellow and red crepe paper. Oh, the candles shaved and the shavings thrown on the floor. Oh, the mad children who skated the wax in evenly. Food appeared. Basins of rice, pots of steaming chicken, dumplings to startle you. And the wine came, gallons and gallons of it. Martinez dug up a keg of potato whiskey from his manure pile and carried it to Danny's house. At 5.30, the friends marched up the hill, tired and bloody, but triumphant. So must the old guard have looked when they returned to Paris after Austerlitz. They saw the house, bristling with color. They laughed, and their weariness fell from them. They were so happy that tears came into their eyes. Mama Tipo walked into the yard, followed by her two sons who carried a wash tub of salsa pura between them. Paulito, that rich scamp, rushed the fire under a big kettle of beans and jelly. Shouts, songs broken off, shrieks of women, the general turmoil of excited children. A car full of apprehensive policemen drove up from Monterey. Oh, it is only a party. Sure, we'll have a glass of wine. Don't kill anybody. Where is Danny? Lonely as smoke on a clear cold night, he drifts through Monterey in the evening. To the post office he goes, to the station, to the pool rooms on Alvarado Street, to the wharf where the black water mourns among the piles. What is it, Danny? What makes you feel this way? Danny didn't know. There was an ache in his heart, like the farewell to a dear woman. 
There was vague sorrow in him, like the despair of autumn. He walked past the restaurants he used to smell with interest, and no appetite was aroused in him. He walked by Madame Zuka's great establishment and exchanged no obscene jests with the girls in the windows. Back to the wharf he went. He leaned over the rail and looked into the deep, deep water. Do you know, Danny, how the wine of your life is pouring into the fruit jars of the gods? Do you see the procession of your days in the oily water among the piles? He remained motionless, staring down. They were worried about him at Danny's house when it began to get dark. The friends left the party and trotted down the hill into Monterey. They asked, have you seen Danny? Yes, Danny walked by here an hour ago. He walked slow. Pilon and Pablo hunted together. They traced their friend over the route he had followed, and at last they saw him on the end of the dark pier. He was lighted by a dim electric wharf light. They hurried out to him. Pablo did not mention it then, but ever afterward it was his custom, when Danny was mentioned, to describe what he saw as he and Pilon walked out on the wharf toward Danny. There he stood, Pablo always said. I could just see him, leaning on the rail. I looked at him, and then I saw something else. At first it looked like a black cloud in the air over Danny's head. And then I saw it was a big black bird as big as a man. It hung in the air like a hawk over a rabbit hole. I crossed myself and said, two Hail Marys. The bird was gone when we came to Danny. Pilon did not see it. Moreover, Pilon did not remember Pablo crossing himself and saying the Hail Marys. But he never interfered with the story, for it was Pablo's story. They walked rapidly toward Danny. The wharf boards drummed hollowly under their feet. Danny did not turn. They took him by the arms and turned him about. Danny, what is wrong? Nothing. I'm all right. Are you sick, Danny? No. Then what is it that makes you so sad? I don't know, said Danny. I just feel this way. I don't want to do anything. Maybe a doctor could do something for you, Danny. I tell you, I am not sick. Then look, Pilon cried. We are having a party for you at your house. Everybody in Tortilla Flat is there, and music, and wine, and chicken. There are maybe 20 or 30 gallons of wine, and bright paper hanging up. Don't you want to come? Danny breathed deeply. For a moment, he turned back to the deep black water. Perhaps he whispered to the gods a promise or a defiance. He swung around again to his friends. His eyes were feverish. You're goddamn right I want to go. Hurry up. I am thirsty. Any girls there? Lots of girls. All the girls. Come on then. Hurry up. He led them running up the hill. Long before they arrived, they could hear the sweetness of the music through the pines and the shrill notes of excited, happy voices. The three belated ones arrived at a dead run. Danny lifted his head and howled like a coyote. Jars of wine were held out to him. He took a gulp from each one. That was a party for you. Always afterwards, when a man spoke of a party with enthusiasm, someone was sure to say with reverence, did you go to that party at Danny's house? And unless the first speaker were a newcomer, he had been there. There was a party for you. No one ever tried to give a better one. Such a thing was unthinkable, for within two days Danny's party was lifted out of possible comparison with all other parties that ever were. What man came out of that night without some glorious cuts and bruises? Never had there been so many fights, not fights between two men, but roaring battles that raged through the whole clots of men, each one for himself. Oh, the laughter of women, thin and high and brittle as spun glass. Oh, the ladylike shrieks of protest from the gulch. Father Ramon was absolutely astounded and incredulous at the confessions the next week. The whole happy soul of Tortilla Flat tore itself from restraint and arose into the air, one ecstatic unit. They danced so hard that the floor gave way in one corner. The accordions played so loudly that always afterwards they were windbroken, like foundered horses. And Danny, just as this party knew no comparison, so Danny defied emulation as a celebrant. In the future, he let some squirt say, 
with excitement. Did you see me? Well, did you see me ask that near wenches for a dance? Did you see us go round and round like a tomcats? And some old, wise, and baleful eye would be turned on him. Some voice, sated with having known the limit of possibilities, would ask quietly, Did you see Danny the night of the party? Sometime a historian may write a cold, dry, fungus-like history of the party. He may refer to the moment when Danny defied and attacked the whole party, men, women, and children with a table leg. He may conclude a dying organism is often observed to be capable of extraordinary endurance and strength. Referring to Danny's superhuman amorous activity that night, the same historian may write with unshaking hands, when any living organism is attacked, its whole function seems to aim toward reproduction. But I say, and the people of Tortilla Flat would say, to hell with it. That Danny was a man for you. No one kept actual count, and afterwards, naturally, no lady would willingly admit that she had been ignored, so that the reputed prowess of Danny may be somewhat overstated. One-tenth of it would be an overstatement for anyone in the world. When Danny went, a magnificent madness followed. It is passionately averred in Tortilla Flat that Danny alone drank three gallons of wine. It must be remembered, however, that Danny is now a god. In a few years, it may be 30 gallons. In 20 years, it may be plainly remembered that the clouds flamed and spelled D-A-N-N-Y in tremendous letters, that the moon dripped blood, that the wolf of the world bayed prophetically from the mountains of the Milky Way. Gradually, a few of those whose stuff was less stern than Danny's began to wilt, to sag, to creep out from underfoot. Those who were left, feeling the lack, shouted the louder, fought the more viciously, danced the harder. In Monterey, the motors of the fire trucks were kept running, and the firemen, in their red tin hats and raincoats, silently sat in their places and waited. The night passed quickly, and still Danny roared through the party. What happened is attested by many witnesses, both men and women, and although their value as witnesses is sometimes attacked on the ground that they had drunk 30 gallons of wine in a keg of potato whiskey, those people are sullenly sure of the major points. It took some weeks to get the story into line. Some said one thing, some another, but gradually the account clarified into the reasonable form it now has and always will have. Danny, say the people of Tortilla Flat, had been rapidly changing his form. He had grown huge and terrible. His eyes flared like the headlights of an automobile. There was something fearsome about him. There he stood, in the room of his own house. He held the pine table leg in his right hand, and even it had grown. Danny challenged the world. Who will fight, he cried. Is there no one left in the world who is not afraid? The people were afraid. That table leg, so hideous and so alive, had become a terror to them all. Danny swung it back and forth. The accordions wheezed to silence. The dancing stopped. The room grew chill, and a silence seemed to roar in the air like an ocean. No one, Danny cried again. Am I alone in the world? Will no one fight with me? The man shuddered before his terrible eyes and watched, fascinated, the slashing path of the table leg through the air and no one answered the challenge. Danny drew himself up. It is said that his head just missed touching the ceiling. Then I will go out to the one who can fight. I will find the enemy who is worthy of Danny. He stalked to the door, staggering a little as he went. The terrified people made a broad path for him. He bent to get out of the door. The people stood still and listened. Outside the house, they heard his roaring challenge. They heard the table leg whistle like a meteor through the air. They heard his footsteps charging down the yard. And then behind the house, in the gulch, they heard an answering challenge so fearful and so chill that their spines wilted like nasturtium stems under frost. Even now when the people speak of Danny's opponent, they lower their voices and lurk furtively about. They heard Danny charge to the fray. They heard his last shrill cry of defiance 
and then a thump, and then silence. For a long moment, the people waited, holding their breaths, lest the harsh rush of air from their lungs should obscure some sound. But they listened in vain. The night was hushed, and the gray dawn was coming. Pilone broke the silence. Something is wrong, he said, and Pilone it was who rushed out of the door. Brave man, no terror could restrain him. The people followed. Back of the house they went, where Danny's footsteps had sounded, and there was no Danny. They came to the edge of the gulch, where a sharp zigzag path led down to the bottom of that ancient water course wherein no stream had flowed for many generations. The following people saw Pilone dart down the path. They went after him slowly, and they found Pilone at the bottom of the gulch, leaning over a broken and twisted Danny. He had fallen 40 feet. Pilone lighted a match. I think he is alive, he shrieked. Run for a doctor. Run for Father Ramon. The people scattered. Within 15 minutes, four doctors were awakened, dragged from their beds by frantic paisanos. They were not allowed that slow deliberateness by which doctors love to show that they are no slaves to emotion. No, they were hustled, rushed, pushed, and their instrument cases were shoved into their hands by men hopelessly incapable of saying what they wanted. Father Ramon dragged from his bed, came panting up the hill, uncertain whether it was a devil to drive out a newborn baby to baptize before it died or a lynching to attend. Meanwhile, Pablo and Pilon and Jesus Maria carried Danny up the hill and laid him on his bed. They stood candles all about him. Danny was breathing heavily. First the doctors arrived. They glanced suspiciously at one another, considered precedence, but the moment of delay brought threatening looks into the eyes of the people. It did not take long to look Danny over. They were all through by the time Father Ramon arrived. I shall not go into the bedroom with Father Ramon, for Pilon and Pablo and Jesus Maria and Big Joe and Johnny Pom Pom and Tito Ralph and the pirate and the dogs were there. And they were Danny's family. The door was and is closed. For after all, there is pride in men. Some things cannot decently be pried into. But in the big room, crowded to suffocation with the people of Tortilla Flat, there was tenseness and awaiting silence. Priests and doctors have developed a subtle means of communication when Father Ramon came out of the bedroom, his face had not changed. But at sight of him, the woman broke into a sigh and terrible wail. The men shifted their feet like horses at a box shell, and then went outside into the dawning, and the bedroom door remained closed. Chapter 17 how Danny's sorrowing friends defied the conventions, how the talismanic bond was burned, how each friend departed alone. Death is a personal matter, arousing sorrow, despair, fervor, or dry-hearted philosophy. Funerals, on the other hand, are social functions. Imagine going to a funeral without first polishing the automobile. Imagine standing at a graveside, not dressed in your best dark suit and your best black shoes, polished delightfully. Imagine sending flowers to a funeral with no attached card to prove you had done the correct thing. In no social institution is the codified ritual of behavior more rigid than in funerals. Imagine the indignation if the minister altered his sermon or experimented with facial expression. Consider the shock if, at the funeral parlors, any chairs were used but those little folding yellow torture chairs with the hard seats. Now, dying, a man may be loved, 
hated, mourned, missed. But once dead, he becomes the chief ornament of a complicated and formal social celebration. Danny was dead, two days dead, and already he had ceased to be Danny. Although the faces of the people were recently and mournfully veiled with gloom, there was excitement in their hearts. The government has promised a military funeral to all of its ex-soldier sons who wish it. Danny was the first of Tortilla Flat to go, and Tortilla Flat was ready critically to test the government promises. Already the news had been sent to the Presidio, and Danny's body had been embalmed at the government's expense. Already, a caisson was duly painted and waiting in the artillery shed with a neat new flag folded on top of it. Already orders of the day for Friday were made out. 10 to 11 a.m. Funeral. Escort. Squadron A. 11th Cavalry. 11th Cavalry Band and Firing Squad. Were these not things to set every woman in Tortilla Flat window shopping at the National Dollar Store in Monterey? During the day, dark children walked the streets of Monterey, begging flowers from the gardens for Danny's funeral. At night, the same children visited the same gardens to augment their bouquets. At the party, the finest clothes had been worn. During the two-day interval, those clothes had to be cleaned, washed, starched, mended, and ironed. The activity was frantic. The excitement was decently intense. On the evening of the second day, Danny's friends were gathered in Danny's house. The shock and the wine had worn off, and now they were horror-stricken, for in all Tortilla Flat, they who had loved Danny most, who had received the most from his hands, they, the Paisanos, were the only ones who could not attend Danny's funeral. Through the murk of the headaches, they had been conscious of this appalling tragedy, but only on this evening had the situation become so concrete that it must be faced. Ordinarily, their clothes were unspeakable. The party had aged their jeans and blue shirts by years. Where was the trouser knee unburst? Where the shirt unripped? If anyone else had died, they could have borrowed clothes, but there was no person in Tortilla Flat who was not going to wear his good clothes to the funeral. Only Cocky Reardon was not going. But Cocky was in quarantine for smallpox, and so were his clothes. Money might be begged or stolen to buy one good suit, but money for six suits was simply impossible to get. You may say, did they not love Danny enough to go to his funeral in rags? Would you go in rags when your neighbors were dressed in finery? Would not the disrespect to Danny be more if they went in rags than if they did not go at all? The despair that lay on their hearts was incalculable. They cursed their fate. Through the front door they could see Galvez parading by. Galvez had bought a new suit for the funeral, and he had it on 24 hours in advance. The friends sat, chin in hand, crushed by their ill fortune. Every possibility had been discussed. He longed for once in his life descended to absurdity. We might go out tonight and each one steal a suit, he suggested. He knew that was silly, for every suit would be laid on a chair beside a bed that night. It would be death to steal a suit. The Salvation Army sometimes gives suits, said Jesus Maria. I have been there, Pablo said. They have 14 dresses this time, but no suits. On every side, fate was against them. Tito Ralph came in with his new green handkerchief sticking out of his breast pocket. But the hostility he aroused made him back apologetically out of the room. If we had a week, we could cut squids, Pilon said heroically. The funeral is tomorrow. We must look in the eye at this thing. Of course we can go to the funeral, all right. How? the friends demanded. We can go on the sidewalk while the band and the people march in the street. It is all grass around the cemetery fence. We can lie there in the grass and see everything. The friends looked at Pilon gratefully. They knew how his sharp wits had been digging over possibilities. 
but it was only half, less than half, to see the funeral. Being seen at the funeral was the most important half. This was the best that could be done. In this we learn a lesson, said Pilon. We must take it to heart that we should always have a good suit of clothes laid by. We can never tell what may happen. There they left it. But they felt that they had failed. All through the night they wondered in the town what yard was not plundered of its finest blooms, what flowering tree remained standing. In the morning the hole in the cemetery that was to receive Danny's body was almost hidden by a mound of the finest flowers from the best gardens in Monterey. It was not always that nature arranges her effects with good taste. Truly it rained before Waterloo. Forty feet of snow fell on the path of the Donner party. But Friday turned out a nice day. The sun arose, though this were a day for a picnic. The gulls flew in across the smiling bay to the sardine canneries. The rock fishermen took their places on the rocks for the ebbing tide. The palace drug company ran down its awnings to protect the red hot water bottles at its windows from the chemical action of the sun. Mr. Mercado, the tailor, put a sign in his window back in 10 minutes and went home to dress for the funeral. Three purse saners came in, loaded with sardines. Louis Duart painted his boat and changed his name from Lolita to the three cousins. Jake Lake, the cop, arrested a roadster from Del Monte and turned it loose and bought a cigar. It is a puzzle. How can life go on its stupid course on such a day? How can Mamie Jackson hose off her front sidewalk? How can George W. Meek write his fourth and angriest letter to the water company? How can Charlie Marsh be as dirtily drunk as usual? It is sacrilege. It is outrage. Danny's friends awakened sadly and got up off the floor. Danny's bed was empty. It was like the riderless charger of an officer which follows its master to his grave. Even Big Joe Portagy had cast no covetous glance at Danny's bed. The sun shone enthusiastically through the window and cast the delicate shadows of spider webs on the floor. Danny was glad on mornings like this, said Pilone. After their trip to the gulch, the friends sat for a while on the front porch and celebrated the memory of their friend. Loyally, they remembered and proclaimed Danny's virtue. Loyally, they forgot his faults. And strong, said Pablo. He was as strong as a mule. He could lift a bale of hay. They told little stories of Danny, of his goodness, his courage, his piety. All too soon it was time to go to the church, to stand across the street in their ragged clothes. They blushed inwardly when luckier people went into the church, dressed so beautifully, smelling so prodigally of Agua Florida. The friends could hear the music and the shrill drone of the service. From their vantage point they saw the cavalry arrive, and the band with muffled drums, and the firing squad, and the caisson, with its three pairs of horses, and a cavalryman on the near horse of each pair. The mournful clop-clop of shod horses on asphalt put despair in the hearts of the friends. Helplessly, they watched the casket carried out and laid on the caisson, and the flag draped over it. The officer blew his whistle, raised his hand, and threw it forward. The squadron moved. The firing squad dropped its rifles. The drums thundered their heartbreaking, slow rhythm. The band played its sodden march. The caisson moved. The people walked majestically behind. Men straight and stern, women daintily holding their skirts up out of the indelible trail of the cavalry. Everyone was there. Cordelia Ruiz, Mrs. Morales, Galvez, Torelli, and his plump wife, Mrs. Palachico, Tito Ralph the traitor, Sweets Ramirez, Mr. Mikado, everyone who amounted to anything on Tortilla Flat, and everyone else was there. Is it any wonder that the friends could not stand the shame and misery of it? For a little while they slunk along the sidewalk, bolstered with heroism. Jesus Maria broke down first. 
he sobbed with shame, for his father had been a rich and respected prize fighter. Jesus Maria put down his head and bolted, and the five other friends followed, and the five dogs bounded behind them. Before the procession was in sight, Danny's friends were lying in the tall grass that edged the cemetery. The service was short and military. The casket was lowered. The rifles cracked. The bugles sang taps. And at the sound, Enrique and Fluff, Pajarito and Rudolph and Senor Alec Thompson laid back their heads and howled. The pirate was proud of them. It was over too soon. The friends walked hurriedly away so that the people would not see them. They had to pass Torelli's deserted house anyway on the way home. Pilone went in through a window and brought out two gallons of wine, and then they walked slowly back to Danny's quiet house. Ceremoniously, they filled the fruit jars and drank. Danny liked wine, they said. Danny was happy when he had a little wine. The afternoon passed, and the evening came. Each man, as he sipped his wine, roved through the past. At seven o'clock, a shamed Tito Ralph came in with a box of cigars he had won on a punch board. The friends lighted the cigars and spat, and opened the second gallon. Pilone tried a few notes of the song Tulipan to see whether his voice was gone for good. Cornelia Ruiz was alone today, Pilone said speculatively. Maybe it will be all right to sing a few sad songs, said Jesus Maria. But Danny did not like sad songs, Pablo insisted. He liked the quick ones about lively women. They all nodded gravely. Yes, Danny was a great one for women. Pablo tried the second verse to Tulipan, and Pilone helped a little, and the others joined in toward the end. When the song was done, Pilone puffed at his cigar, but it had gone out. Tito Ralph, he said, why don't you get your guitar so we can sing a little better? He lighted his cigar and flipped the match. The little burning stick landed on an old newspaper against the wall. Each man started to stamp it out, and each man was struck with a celestial thought and settled back. They found one another's eyes and smiled, the wise smiles of the deathless and hopeless ones. In a reverie, they watched the flame flicker and nearly die and sprout to life again. They saw it bloom on the paper. Thus do the gods speak with tiny causes. And the men smiled on as the paper burned and the dry wooden wall caught. Thus must it be, O wise friend of Danny. The cord that bound you together is cut. The magnet that drew you has lost its virtue. Some stranger will own the house, some joyless relative of Danny's. Better that this symbol of holy friendship, this good house of parties and fights, of love and comfort, should die as Danny died, in one last glorious, hopeless assault on the gods. They sat and smiled, and the flame climbed like a snake to the ceiling and broke through the roof and roared. Only then did the friends get up from their chairs and walk like dreaming men out of the door. Pilone, who profited by every lesson, took what was left of the wine with him. The sirens screamed from Monterey. The trucks roared up the hill in second gear. The searchlights played among the trees. When the department arrived, the house was one great blunt spear of flame. The hoses wet the trees and brush to keep the flames from spreading. Among the crowding people of Tortilla Flat, Danny's friends stood in trance and watched until at last the house was a mound of black steaming cinders. Then the fire trucks turned and coasted away down the hill. The people of the flat melted into the darkness. Danny's friends still stood looking at the smoking ruin. They looked at one another strangely and then back to the burned house. And after a while they turned and walked slowly away and no two walked together. <laughs>